And joining us now is Catherine Zahn, President and CEO at CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health here in Toronto, and it's good to have you in our studio tonight. It's great to be here, thank you. Okay, 30 million bucks, that's not bad. You got the announcement this week that mm -hmm. the granddaughters of Roy Thompson, uh, the media magnet once upon a time, are giving you this gift. What are you gonna do with the money? Well, I think the first uh, order of business is to celebrate because this is a landmark uh, initiative for the world of mental health. It means so much to uh, CAMH, the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, to uh, have gotten the vote of confidence from the uh, Campbell family to uh, carry on some of the research that we've already started. And but what kind of research will it now make possible? This is going to build on our fundamental brain research. And right now we have uh, some significant uh, excellence and a great track record in our genetics, our epigenetic research, brain uh, uh, neurophysiology, and uh, imaging. And we want to add to that strength in understanding a little bit better how the different parts of the brain uh, connect with each other. So you got 30 million from Roy Thompson's granddaughters. You got 10 million from Bell, right, earlier this year? That's right. Those two huge donations, I cannot imagine, would have happened 10 years ago. So something's changed. What's changed? That's part of the, uh, the uh, amazing nature of this. Uh, and I think we'd have to go back a few years to a movement that was started perhaps with the National Commission uh, on Mental Health, led by Michael Kirby. Subsequently, uh, a number of, of high-profile individuals willing to speak out about the problems that they themselves or their family members or their friends have had with, with mental illness, actually to try to legitimize it, to bring it out of the closet. And what we're seeing more and more is that now that we, we understand more, we understand more about the brain, the mechanisms of the brain that uh, can go awry in the context of uh, developing mental illness, there's uh, an opportunity for, uh, for, for people to understand that there's hope. And I think if you imagine 40 years ago, talking about cancer, you might be asking the same questions. Where did the movement come from? And I believe that the movement always starts with uh, knowledge. Uh, the knowledge that allows people, first of all, to have hope, but also uh, when you think about uh, fear, prejudice, discrimination, uh, the antidotes to those things are knowledge and familiarity. Okay, let me push a little further on this because true, I think, uh, you know, Valerie Pringle, Lincoln Alexander, uh, Robin Robarts, the daughter of the former premier, mm -hmm. Uh, Claire Hughes, I mean, there have been a lot of Michael Landsberg from TSN, a lot of people out there talking about depression. Mm -hmm. Not so much about bipolar or schizophrenia or some of the other things. So attitudes towards depression, 100% changed. What about these other things? Well, those are the areas, as it turns out, that we are learning the most about. So learning or understanding the uh, genetics, for example, the genetic predisposition to some of these conditions, schizophrenia, bipolar are two great examples. Also, uh, uh, in some cases, genetic predispositions to addictions of, of various sorts. But it's, uh, of course, it's not that simple. Uh, uh, all of these uh, genetic predispositions have uh, uh, a greater uh, incidence in the population than is manifest by mental illness. So we know that there's a, an amazing interplay between the environment, early childhood experience, Experiences, perhaps even neurodevelopmental uh, experiences. So, uh, the nature of your in utero environment, the nutrition of your mother, uh, the uh, experiences you have in, in early childhood that uh, that actually develop healthy or unhealthy uh, brain connections. Well, let's continue on that continuum, if I can. Okay, depression, mm -hmm. schizophrenia, bipolar, alcoholism. Are, do you think people are ready yet to consider addictions such as alcoholism as? not just a weakness of character, but actually something going on in the brain. I think that's absolutely the direction that uh, there, but once again, it's complex and, and there is an interplay between uh, uh, the, the mental illnesses that we just talked about, increasing your risk of, uh, of uh, alcoholism or other addictions, and it, uh, 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 there are a lot of environmental factors that, uh, that play into this. But uh, I, I, I think that there's a growing awareness that there are uh, occurrences in one's environment that uh, uh, enhance that predisposition and uh, uh, the development of stressful situations later in life can trigger them. So, so uh, the movement uh, ac across North America, uh, for sure, is to uh, bring the study of those conditions uh, right into the fold of uh, mental illness, but per perhaps more important, and, and one of the things that's really important to me is that growing understanding that mental health needs to be part of the conversation of health care.
mm -hmm. and health in general. Uh, it's, uh, there is a, a huge burden of illness in our society that has uh, an impact on, impact on individuals, their families, and uh, uh, in fact, the economy that, uh, that uh, makes it important that we, we consider this, bring it into the centrality of, of health and approach it as we do other health issues. Can we talk about wiring for a second here? We can. Brain wiring. <laughs> brain circuitry research is one of the things this donation is going to help fund. What is brain circuitry research? Well, we started out by talking about genetics, about a genetic predisposition, and, and uh, if you think back perhaps a decade, uh, there was a lot of language about mental illness being uh, uh, related to a chemical imbalance. And uh, uh, if you if I could give you a little lesson about uh, what, go what goes on in the brain, it's true that the interactions between brain cells occur through chemical mechanisms. Um, but what we know now is that those connections that uh, result in chemical action in the brain are, uh, are, are, are also dependent on the uh, big bundle of electrical cables that make up the most of your brain. And until recently we thought that once you were an adult, all that was fixed. It was immutable. It was uh, written in stone. But the fact is, uh, research has shown that those connections amongst various parts of the brain can change. So you can retune your brain circuits. You can retune your brain circuits. Even in adulthood. Even in adulthood. We know that they, uh, they uh, change in an unhealthy way as a result of, of uh, a traumatic event. Uh, thus, the importance of understanding trauma in childhood years as, uh, as a, predisposition, a predisposing factor to mental illness. And we know that we know through imaging studies uh, that they can change in a positive way as the result of uh, talking therapy, for example. Mm -hmm. They can certainly change in uh, response to medications and external stimuli. So but when you say a traumatic event, uh, I mean, you're not talking about a car accident, right? You're talking about like a divorce or bullying or something like that? Any, all, all of the above. All of the above. All of the above. Okay. Which mental illnesses or addictions do you think this kind of brain circuitry research would be most appropriate to help? I think at the end of the day, it will be referable to most. Uh, right off the bat, it is uh, uh, hard to say. It's hard for me to answer that question. Uh, uh, and I'm going to ask you at some point to refer to some of our scientists for further information on that. But uh, uh, I think that the, uh, the areas where that it's been most prominently looked at have been in depression and in people who have had traumatic events in their, uh, in their life. Okay. All of this, I guess, is a relatively, you know, recent development. How we view mental illness, how we treat right. mental illness. Uh, we talked about this a bit off the top. How has our understanding of mental illness evolved to the point where we're at right now? The, first and foremost, I'm going to uh, make another plug for the fact that we understand more about the brain now. Uh, and, and perhaps uh, it's a little bit trite to say it, but it certainly is the final frontier in our understanding of uh, uh, the way the human body works and uh, certainly the part of the body that uh, defines who we are as, as human beings is uh, uh, there's still a lot to be discovered. What's The bulk of what's been discovered in the brain has really only been in the last uh, several decades and so there's, there's, uh, there's, there's still a long way to go. But um, the, the, uh, the impact of the impact on the brain, I would say, once again, is is uh, what we don't completely understand, and uh, there's still a lot to do. Mm -hmm. And are medical schools teaching it? Yes, they are. They are probably. Yeah. Eh? Mm -hmm. the, I, th I think that, that that there isn't enough emphasis, perhaps, on, uh, on on mental illness in the medical schools. And I'm I'm going to go back to your previous question. We talked about the brain being uh, one important uh, component of uh, what's changed in the world, but there is a there's another huge assumption that was made in the past that's been changing, and this is a really important topic at, uh, at, at CAMH. The assumptions that we make about people with mental illness, what their uh, opportunities and their options in life are, and what they can expect from their lives. And uh, the origin of my current organization was the um, uh, asylum on Queen Street that was built in 1850. And at that point, there was an assumption that uh, people with serious mental illness required protection. They required to be behind closed doors uh, for any number of positive and, and negative reasons. But we now have a, a huge understanding about the possibilities for people with mental illness and options for, uh, for treatment. And so you we have... You don't use the word cure, do you? Uh, I haven't yet. Yeah. But uh, uh, 
think that's coming? Next year you're going to have me back and we'll talk about that. I think but that's the, possible. But what's, what people talk about now is recovery. Uh, and and when you say when you say cure, uh, I'm going to assume that you're talking about people with uh, some of the major mental illnesses like schizophrenia or bipolar disease. Right now, people live with those diseases, live with those conditions, and they can have very good lives with the proper supports. We also know that if their um, if management strategies are put in place early in the trajectory of the condition, it can be modified. And, uh, and, and thus the move to support people uh, more in society to uh, uh, have them uh, have the appropriate level of, uh, of housing and income support that they need to, to actually, have a, uh, uh, actually have a good life. And that, that actually underlies the, uh, the big changes that you're seeing on West Queen West, the redevelopment. Uh, the, the wall is gone. The uh, organization is being redeveloped with streets going through the campus. We're, we're uh, so you mean communicating. More integrated into the city itself. Integrated into the city. Can as I ask mentioned. you about? You spoke of Final Frontier, and in, in, in our last 30 seconds here, let me ask you this. One of the saddest things I ever heard about your place was when we did a program a couple of years ago that you didn't have a gift shop. Mm -hmm. Every other hospital everywhere has a gift shop. You can go in there, buy a stuffed teddy bear, anyway, whatever, mm -hmm. flowers. Do you have a gift shop yet? We do not. But we have buildings opening in June, and uh, and, and I'm committed to making uh, a either either an intersection of, uh, of a Main Street and Market Street where people could come and have a, have a gift shop or a, or, a t or a city center area where we can uh, uh, we can rectify that. We look forward to seeing that, Dr. Catherine Thanks. Zahn. It's good of you to come into TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks very much.